everybody. Welcome to the Rock Consultant Weekly Webinar for the bread industry. My name is Josh Gregory. I am the Vice President for Education here at Rock Consultant. Uh, just a reminder for everybody who may not have been here before, or maybe you've been here every week, but these webinars are really just for you to learn about this new industry. I want you to be here to ask any questions you do have, and then find the best way that if you do decide to pursue this industry, to help accelerate it and move as quickly as you can. Now, again, if, if you are watching this live, if you're not watching it on YouTube later, uh, then there will be a Q&A at the end. So if you have any questions for myself or my co-host, you can type those in at any point during the webinar, and then we'll get to those at the end and kind of go back and forth and answer any questions anyone has. My only request of all of you is that if you do have questions, make sure you put it in the Q&A button at the bottom of this window. If you raise your hand or if you put it in the chat, I'm going to miss it. So if you want me to answer the question, make sure you put it in the Q&A. And it can be about anything that we talk about today or anything on the bread space as a whole. Uh, and Steve and I will do our best to answer it. Now, if you were here last week, what we focused on were the trucks and then how to properly repair and maintain those trucks. So this week, we're going to focus on the other side of the equation. We always, most things in the logistics space come down to people and trucks. Uh, and so for, we've talked about trucks, we're going to talk about people this time. And so we're going to be focusing on the strategies for recruiting and retaining. And many of you may have been in the logistics space before or been in the FedEx space, Amazon, and done some of this, but it, it is going to look a little bit different in the bread space. So for that discussion, we've brought Stephen Ryan back on to help share his expertise. So Stephen, if you want to go ahead and jump on and say hello, and then we can get started. Hey, Josh, great to be back with you. Great to see you as well. Um, so for everybody who's you know thought about this space before, I think the the easiest kind of ground level thing to start with is what are the requirements set out? What are the things that you actually have to have to be able to be you know recruited as a driver for this space? Yeah, great question. From an operational standpoint, I mean, it's a great starting point to think about someone you want to work with, right? So someone that you can easily engage with that is open to. Um, constructive criticism that can take, um, you know, some of the ups and downs that you'll run into in the grocery business, dealing with different personalities um, and, you know, ride that out. So operationally, um, someone that you can work with, and then a simple background check and a relatively clean um, MVR is going to be a great kind of baseline. Um, that's going to get you access into the depot. And then, of course, if you are employing them as a W-2 driver, the cleaner that MVR, the, the lower your insurance rates. But a little different than the FedEx space, a lot of people um, are familiar with you have to have a W-2 employee. That's not necessarily the case um, in the bread space. You can certainly utilize a subcontractor, 1099 them, and then allow them to cover all their own expenses. <clears throat> and that is, that is definitely different than the FedEx space. There was a, there were a, uh, wide variety of lawsuits and things that happened about you know 10 years ago in the FedEx space where 1099s are not allowed. You're all W2 employees. So um, that is different where there's some flexibility uh, in this space. And so just to, to clarify that background check, is any of that done by the bakery or is it all kind of on you to do as a part of that qualification process? Yeah, that's going to be on you and you'll need to present it to the bakery in order to get them access into the depot. If you're operating out of a staff depot, there are some locations that may operate out of a more, you know, hybrid uh, situation and you may not need to do the, any of that. Got it. And then is it is it just using any background check agency online? There's no required certain vendor you have to use or anything like that? That's correct. Perfect. Yeah. So those of us who are from the FedEx side and are familiar with First Advantage and the, uh, the, the challenges, I would say, uh, that will not be something that you encounter on this side of the equation. You know, as soon as you can get a background check, it's a pretty simple process there. Uh, and, you know, one of the things to think about is let's say you have a driver on the FedEx side or the Amazon side that maybe for some reason or another, they've been disqualified. Um, and maybe it's something where you still think they're a good driver, but they just don't check the FedEx or Amazon boxes. They may be a good fit for this space because maybe you trust them. It's just for one reason or another, they don't check the perfect boxes for FedEx or Amazon. There's a good chance that they're still going to be fine to drive in the bread space. <laughs> now, so, so I know that a lot of people start driving their own vehicles. They don't have anyone as an employee. So when you kind of first made the decision to hire a driver, can you kind of talk through one, the, the thought process of how you got there and then 
when you decided to, to start to hand over some of the reins in your company, what were you really looking for to find that right person to trust? Yeah. So as I transitioned from an owner operator to more of an owner manager, um, I was operating a pretty large route, about 22, 23 stores. And so I had an AB schedule. So I would hit maybe 10 to 12 stores on a Monday and then the remaining half on a Tuesday. And as we grew, as the routes grew, I had more stores that I needed to service on a Monday than I could physically get to with the time constraints around door times. And so as I grew and tried to be more efficient, I started bringing someone on part-time three days a week um, to go out. I would go the night before or the day before and pre-sell all my orders. And so I could maybe cut down on about four hours in a, in a given um, work day the day before or the night before and allow him to be more efficient in the stores, servicing, delivering, merchandising. And so that was a stopgap measure for me to grow, um, to figure out how I could do this well with an employee, um, figure out how to serve them well, and then eventually split that into two routes, um, brought that, continued with that driver and moved him into a full-time position, allowed him some freedom and flexibility to start making his own orders, um, to interact with the bakery more on my behalf, um, and so that's how I transitioned into multiple, multiple routes. Perfect. So, so you decided to bring that guy and you did, you did some kind of pre-work to make their day easier. What are kind of the skills though, that you were looking for in that person? And are there things that maybe you are kind of a minimum level? Like I need to make sure they've got this and the rest I can train them on. Like, are there any of those types of thoughts that went into when you brought this first driver on? Yeah, first and foremost, has to be someone that you can trust. So you need to remember that as the owner, as the um, contractor, you know, you accept all the risk that that employee brings. And so honesty, integrity, those those are paramount. Um, obviously, we talked about this as early morning work. And so wanting to find the right person that's not necessarily a night owl, that's not going to be a good fit long term for an operation. And so those were kind of the two main focus is, of course, someone that's friendly, that can interact with store managers. Um, those are kind of the baselines for someone that's going to be successful in this business. And then again, someone that can do the same thing over and over every day. There's not a lot of excitement, um, but in some ways that's really appealing to a lot of drivers. They know what to expect on a daily basis. They can go, they can make a consistent check um, and they can come home. Yeah. And as if they're comfortable being alone then or comfortable doing the same thing, then, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's lots of jobs like that, construction or things like that, where you can listen to podcasts or that you can do things during the day. And for a lot of guys, that is, you know, you're not looking for excitement in that kind of job. A lot of times you're trying to keep things as little excitement as possible. Um, so, and we'll get into some of those other roles in a little bit, but, um, you know, it's probably really important to be explicit in the job ads that it is an early morning uh, type of role and, and not let them be surprised by that so that you're getting the right applicants. Um, now, but I know you've worked for a couple of different bakeries and, and owned routes for a couple of different bakeries. Is there anything different that you look for <clears throat> a driver for, you know, between something like Pepperidge and something like Mission Tortillas, different kinds of skill sets you need there? Not necessarily skill set. The job is going to be relatively the same. The biggest difference is understanding the settlement process, whether this is purchased inventory, whether this is consignment, and then how you can pay them well. And so you're not going to serve a driver well if he's looking for a consistent paycheck and you're 1099ing him or you're paying him a percentage because you're going to see such big swings, not only in sales, but in settlements. If you are, for instance, W2ing someone and you make in some situations go one, two weeks without a paycheck. And then all that settlement catches back up and you get one large one. The way W-2 earnings are calculated, it's annualized. And so if you get a small paycheck on a weekly basis, they're gonna annualize that and they're gonna take a certain percentage out um, based on that tax bracket. And then you get a really large check and they annualize that and they think that you're gonna make you know $200,000 a year and you really get hit with that big deduction. And so you're not serving your employee well. Of course, it's going to all average out at the end of the year when they file their taxes. But for a guy that's expecting consistent income to make a mortgage payment, um, to serve his family, you really have to know how settlement is going to happen. And so as you're evaluating routes, it's really great to look at 
settlement or look at deposit schedules into a bank account so that you can kind of get a gauge of how much fluctuation there is within that. Again, it's going to be uh, more fluctuations in a purchased inventory situation than it will be on consignment. And just just quickly, for those who don't know, can you explain like in a, you know, at a high level, the difference between purchased inventory and consignment? Consignment, the product is going to be billed out to your account on your behalf. And then as you invoice the customer, your account is going to be credited. Same thing with purchased inventory. However, if you end up with more inventory at the end of the week than you're able to sell, your account's going to have a negative balance. So we just came out of Super Bowl. We have lots of promotions. And so as you build displays, as you put product out, as you really ramp up in the two to three weeks that lead into Super Bowl, you may have a lot of product out in the market that you maybe haven't been paid for, your account hasn't been credited for. And so you can work into situations where you may have one or two weeks where you're behind on settlement, you may have a negative balance and that's normal. And then you'll get all that sell through that big, um, that big drive in the grocery business. And then all that evens out, you get a huge check in, in three weeks. Um, and so those are some of the things that you take on as an owner that don't necessarily serve an employee well. If they wanted to own their own business, if they wanted to manage the risk that that brings, not having any vacation time, dealing with those fluctuations in sales, um, they certainly can go out and buy a route themselves. But those are kind of some of the value adders that you can bring in this business to serve them better and to alleviate some of the pain points that an owner operator feels. Yeah. And, and I think that's really important is that it, it's all a part of the same equation. You need to understand how the revenue works. You need to understand what your drivers care about. And that's all going to kind of fold into how you pay them, how you structure their day. And so, you know, none of the parts are isolated. You have to understand the business and in context. I think that's a really important note that, you know, just because something looks good on your payroll doesn't mean your drivers are going to like it. <laughs> so you got to make sure you understand their priorities and what's good for both you and the business and make the right decisions there. Now, um, you know, when we're talking about advertising or when we're talking about hiring people, do you use advertisements? Do you go out? Is it pure word of mouth? Like what are the different ways, different mediums you use for recruiting? Yeah, in my experience, I've been very successful simply from a word of mouth perspective, um, starting with the sphere of influence, friends, family members, church, um, other vendors even, you know, asking them, hey, do you have a friend or a family member? Do you know anybody that's looking for work? Um, those are great ways. Not only are they personal, but the person that's recommending you has a has a vested interest in, hey, I know this guy. I know how he treats his his employees. I think he would be a great fit uh, for you. And, and then connecting those dots, usually if you can get maybe two to three layers deep within your sphere of influence, you can start to have a pretty good candidate pool. Certainly you can go job board indeed. Um, you're gonna have a lot more filtering through to do. A lot of people aren't familiar with the grocery business. And so um, just be aware that if you go that route, um, it's gonna be a little bit more labor intensive. Yeah, and you'll wanna, like I said, you'll wanna be really clear, as, as clear as you can be on what the job is, but even still you'd be shocked at, you know, how many times you put this job goes, you need to be available from like two to 10 a.m. And then the first thing they'll ask when they, when you'll call them, you'll do the, the first interview and they'll say, hey, uh, I can't work till noon. Is that okay? And it's like, no, no, it's not okay. Oh uh, man, but yeah, the, the things you find in job ads are always exciting, but um, uh, okay. So that's, I think that's helpful. And I think for people who are kind of getting into the space to understand that, you know, you're doing a lot of, you're in and out of those grocery stores often. And so, you may be meeting people who know other drivers or who know others that are um, looking for additional work or looking for a, a switch and just kind of putting it out there that you're looking for a driver is often the best way. And then referral bonuses, whatever you need there to, to help incentivize that word of mouth. But in a lot of industries, that's the same. Um, and, and I think that's similar here. And I think a, another kind of helpful point for people to understand, you know, what, what type of turnover do you see in the drivers that you've brought on? Yeah, so that really depends on how you hire, um, how you pay. In my experience, I have not had a huge turnover. Uh, I'm pretty involved with my guys. I like to be in my stores maybe one, two days a week just to check in, you know, have a personal relationship with them, know that I care, you know, that age old adage that, you know, people will forget what you said, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. That really goes a long way in maintaining loyalty um, and making sure that 
you're invested in the relationship with them more than just the business relationship. Personally, you want to know about their kids. You want to know how to serve them. And those little things, you know, my son just got into football. You know, you can, you can surprise a driver, you know, get him some NFL tickets, surprise him. Thank you. You know, give, give those personally in person where you can, you know, imply some cadence and, you know, that smile on your face, that genuineness. Thank you. I'm so grateful for your employment, you know, um, and you got to know your guys, you got to know how to serve them. Um, and that will really go a long way in making sure that you have long tenure because these businesses can be difficult. You know, when a guy is out at three in the morning in the back of a truck and it's cold, you know, he could be doing this for a lot of different people. So why is he doing it for you? And that's really the value that you add as an owner. And you find a lot of, I have found a lot of satisfaction in that, um, in being, a, in being an owner. Yeah. And, and I think, I mean, I can't tell you how many times the things the you know, the little, little small gifts or small company things that we got for drivers meant way more than, you know, uh, uh, a little payroll increase that we might've done. They don't talk to you and remember those things, but you know, little knickknacks sometimes are the things that they're going to keep on their dashboard and they think about all the time. Um, or if you can know them personally, yeah, just like that, a gift that you know is something valuable for them can often go farther than anything else you do for that driver. So yeah, in these businesses, yeah. it's really easy for, you know, people to throw more money at someone else. Everyone's looking for consistency. And so you you need to expect that your drivers are going to at least try to be poached by your competition. And so that loyalty, that going above and beyond, um, you know, be honest with them. You know, I want what's best for you. Maybe you can go across the street and make another dollar, two dollars or an, an hour. Um, but remember that, you know, you may not be appreciated nearly as much over there as you are here. Yeah. And, and that's, that matters for longevity and retention more than, than the dollar. Um, now you mentioned something though, you know, you like to be in and out of stores a couple of times a week. So what's a good way to think about how to find out if your drivers are actually doing a good job and trying to monitor them and, and ascertain if they're, if they're doing what you hired them for. Yeah. Well, the unique thing about this business is you have multiple layers of management that are not even on your payroll. So you have store managers, you have grocery managers, and then you have district managers. And so, you know, a quick follow up in person, maybe once a month asking, you know, how's your service been? How are we doing at peak times? What's the main focus of your store right now? You know, online grocery is a big focus. And so as you ask those probing questions, not only do they feel like you care, but it allows you to more tailor um, your conversations with your driver to make sure that you're meeting your, your retailers expectations specific to what they're focused on right now. You know, everybody has a boss in this business. And so understanding what the focus is allows you to serve your customer better and really um, get that raving review when the district manager follows up and asks, how's your service? Well, he was just in here two weeks ago asking me the same thing. And so when you're top of mind, you really get that raving review. You get an advocate um, at the corporate level as a representative to them in the stores. Yeah, and that is actually, it, you're right. It is pretty unique and nice that you get, you can get direct feedback on your driver from multiple sources and get a good sense of how things are trending and hopefully correct it before it's an issue. <laughs> um, now, so on beyond just kind of hiring someone for the driving side, are there any other types of roles or anything else that maybe are is a better first step when you bring somebody into the organization than as a driver? Absolutely. Part time, you know, there's always merchandising that needs to be done. And for people that maybe aren't familiar, that's going out and, and either building displays, taking down displays, rotating product from one place to another, um, <clears throat> excuse me, fronting up displays. You know, people tend to you know, want to purchase from the back of the se section, buying the freshest product and things tend to get a little messy. And so when a customer walks in and they see that that messy shelf, it, it conveys a sense of this isn't fresh, it hasn't been serviced. And those subtleties um, that people perceive as they walk through the, the grocery space are often the, um, the differentiating point whether they choose to select that product or not. And so you may deliver three, four times a week and then utilize a merchandiser one or two days a week um, and that could be either the driver or, you know, a part-time person in your organization that floats around taking care of those things. Yeah. And that's a great way to kind of expose them to the industry and, and get a sense for if they're capable of doing some of those higher level conversations in addition to driving. And if, if it is that type of driver that can 
do the driving and can handle merchandising, maybe that's somebody that you can offload in even more responsibilities, pay a little bit differently and take, you know, more time out of your day and that they're able to handle so you can focus on other things. So sometimes that can be a great way to, to bring somebody into the space. Um, yeah, we've talked about before, the hardest part about this business is managing a fresh inventory. And then knowing that, you know, one store right across the street sells 50 a week and the store right down the road sells 10. And so knowing where to put it, and you can start to sense that as a merchandiser, not necessarily working with a handheld, interacting with the bakery, dealing with store managers. As you get familiar with the type of volume that each store does, rotating product around, you can start to onboard someone a lot faster into the driver role if they're already familiar with the stores. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I think I think that's a that's always an option and something for you to consider as you're trying to start to pull back from being an owner operator if that is the type of business you you take on from the beginning. Um, now, just as a last point here, uh, I, I, you know, I know that there's nothing really required, but do you provide any type of benefits or do you know anyone who does in this space? Again, here, you know, scale is your friend. So the larger your scale, the more benefits you can offer. For me, um, I offer two weeks paid vacation, um, a benefit package if they want it. You know, you can kind of take a route, look at your top line revenue, figure out what you want to pay for an employee and then tailor that package to serve their needs if they want, you know, three, four days a week, if they want to work more or less, if you want to pay them more and offer less um, bonus retirement account contributions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it allows you some flexibility there to do what the what the employee needs. Which is, you know, that's the nice thing about this business. There's a ton of flexibility. You get a, a lot of opportunity to kind of structure the right pay plan, the right benefit package for whatever your driver needs and whatever best benefits the business. And so there's no hard requirements, but there are lots of options. So as you're getting into it, you're, that may be a way you differentiate yourself from other contractors is the, the types of benefits you offer. Because like Steven said, you know, there's always going to be somebody who can throw uh, more money at your at the drivers, but not everybody's going to offer good benefits. So sometimes that's a way to help, you know, be the only one at the depot who will give two weeks of paid vacation or the only one at the depot who offers some uh, kind of health insurance if they want it. You know, there's lots of options there. It doesn't always have to be expensive either. It's more of just that you have it as an option. And sometimes that can go the distance. So uh, I think that's everything that we wanted to focus on today on the recruiting side. I think for those of you who are thinking about this for the first time, a lot of it's easier. A lot of it in terms of the barrier to entry and barrier to hiring. Uh, there's not a lot that comes down from the bakery forcing anything onto what those drivers have to be outside of a background check. And then once you've got them in, your goal is to make sure that you understand that driver, that you're building compensation plans that you know, kind of fit what they need and fit what works with your business. But you've got a lot of flexibility on how you structure that. And then from there, thinking about, you know, what that driver's capable, if they can do merchandising, or if that needs to be something you keep, that's all part of the business decision that you get to take on as an owner and make those decisions as you're growing and deciding where it's best to spend your time and resources. Uh, but the good news is uh, this side of the equation is a lot easier in some other spaces because of the the level of requirement for finding those drivers. So um, that's the main thing that I wanted to cover. If anyone has any questions, they can drop them in the chat. If not, you've, you've probably got a minute or two to type them in. I got to go through uh, the new listings for the week and then a couple of upcoming events. So uh, four new listings this week. So we've got one out of North Carolina. It is one route at $202,000. Uh, it's currently operating 12 weekly accounts. Uh, we've got one that is out of Iowa. It's two routes at $110,000. It's currently doing 15 accounts. We've got one in Florida that is two routes at $223,000. This one also has two trucks included in the sale, and it's doing 29 weekly accounts. And then the last one is out of Arizona. It's one route at $60,000, uh, and it's got 10 weekly accounts. So few different places across the country that we've got listings, new listings in. If you're interested in any of those, you can always reach out to info at routeconsultant.com and we can give you all the details on the business, help you decide if it's the right one for you. Um, also, if you are here for the first time or watching one of these videos for the first time, we do have a couple of ways for you to continue to find out about the space. Uh, we do have a one-on-one that's free on our website. If you just want to go and register, you can 
go and watch the videos that we already have there right now. Um, we're also going to keep doing these webinars every week. So you can always be here 2 p.m. on Wednesday and come and find out, hear from Stephen and I about what's new for the week. And we this will continue to be a place that you can come and learn. Um, we're also going to have a summit online soon. And along with that is, uh, you know, a digital workshop that you'll be able to participate in. Now, I think we just had a quick one from um, the Lacey. How do you buy a bread route? So a couple of different ways. We've got a bunch of our listings on our site. If you have interest in any of those, you can reach out. The way that the actual purchase looks is it's going to vary. Um, you know, you can always buy cash. Of course, it's always an option. If you're trying to find financing means, um, a lot of the bakeries actually do provide financing directly um, to facilitate the purchase. So you may be able to just get the funds directly from the bakery, depending on the purchase price. Uh, sometimes also you could do something like a combination of cash that you bring to the table and the seller may finance a certain amount of the deal, or maybe it's a combination of cash and seller financing and, and bakery financing. They're all options. So really, if you're interested in any of these based on the area, reach out to our team. We can talk you through your options based on what you're bringing to the table and, and what financing options there are for that particular deal and help you make that decision, guide you through the process. So if that is your question, like I said, reach out directly to our team, info at routeconsultant.com. We can walk you through that process. And then if you're getting into the space, if you're trying to find out how to be successful, either you've already acquired one or you're gonna acquire one soon, we have ways you can partner with Steven to learn the best way to build the business and you know to, to have him as a resource every single week to be able to ask questions on how to structure things, on how to chat, answer general problems you're running into each week. Um, a question, a follow-up question, do you have to have an authority to deliver for routes? You do from the specific bakeries. So that's what you're buying is kind of the rights to a territory. Um, and sometimes these listings also come with say, with trucks involved as well as with assets. So basically you're, you will buy it from an existing contractor, the rights to a specific territory and area. And then you have the rights to deliver to all of the accounts in that area. And if there's anything that comes up, there may be accounts that are in that territory that are currently not purchasing any product from your bakery. There are ways you can go and win those accounts as well and uh, generate additional revenue by finding new accounts to bring in as long as it's within your territory. So there's lots of opportunity beyond what comes with it, but they are protected territories. And that is you know, what you're purchasing in addition to any assets that are a part of the sale. Okay, I am not seeing any other questions come through. So thanks everybody for being here, for asking questions. Um, we will be here, like I said, same time every week. So if you uh, come next week, we'll be here. Come a month from now, we'll be here. Other than that, there's all those different ways to engage. If you wanna go to our website, we have a lot of sections you can jump into. Uh, but Stephen, thank you so much for being here again, always being here to provide your knowledge and answer questions for everyone who's on here. Thank you, Josh. See you next week. Yep. For everybody else, we will see you next week. Hopefully you all have a great rest of the week.